So this talk is going to be a slightly different level than Sam's talk, I would say. Sam's giving you really high-level ideas, which is awesome. We're going to get down into the weeds of talking about some implementation. All right, so first, intro, who am I? So I'm David Whittington. I work at PDS. I help run Arweave.net, which, depending on your experience there, either you're welcome or I'm sorry. Hopefully it's more you're welcome. I do think these systems, people tend to pay attention when they have problems as opposed to when they work well. Hopefully you have a new experience there. More importantly for this talk, uh, I helped build the RIO gateways. Past, I've done a lot of interesting things, different things like early infrastructure as code. I did claims processing, game Kickstarter, satellite internet stuff. Throughout my career, there's been certain themes of working with large databases and functional programming. I actually like the lazy evaluation thing because that's, that's what I'm familiar with. Okay, so I just wanted to put this up here. And by the way, the friends thing, that's very tongue in cheek for me. That's hello, how do you do fellow kids? I'm not really in this space. So anyway, I think we're doing great. Like we're accomplishing a lot here. And the reason I want to put this up is for me with my background, like enterprise computing, I see stuff in this space where every day it's like, Oh my goodness, what are we doing? But I think this thing that we're doing together here in our weave of like making permissionless storage, storing history for the future, we all see that in different ways, but I think that is really important. I think we should be proud of what we've accomplished. And everyone here building on this and working on it is making this happen. I appreciate your efforts. Okay, getting into the meat of this presentation. I'm gonna be talking about some advanced blockchain technology. What is it? It's the SCP field. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone? No, probably not. You should be very suspicious now. This doesn't even sound like a blockchain thing. And you're right, it's not. Has anyone read this book? Some people, yes. Okay, so the SCP field is the somebody else's problem field. I'm gonna suggest that we use this technology a little bit less in one specific area that I'm gonna talk about. And by the way, I use this, everyone uses this. We all build on top of towers of abstraction, so it's not like you can know everything, but it's important to understand the abstractions you're building on and like when you're building on them and what things you're ignoring uh, when you do. All right, so who knows what this is? Okay, cool. Developers here. I'm, not, I'm never sure like how many developers I'm talking to. Let's talk about GraphQL. And this is maybe where we sometimes apply this field. Okay, so this is what I imagine some people see when they, when they look at GraphQL. It's magic things. You write the GraphQL, magic happens, and you get results. None of you think this way, I'm sure, but you have friends, and you can talk to them afterwards and tell them to not think this way. This is what I see <laughs> when I see GraphQL. And by the way, this is not a real query. This is like a couple of things I cobbled together from different places. So it's not even like a real R drive query. I see. Oh look, there's joins. And that thing, that's or, that's disjunction. And ooh, there's another one down there, and that thing's a sort. Oh no. Oh no. This is, I see bad times in the future for people writing this query, which thankfully is not a real query. Okay, so what can you do about this? This is where I shill our code. There's a QR code there. You can go there and grab the RIO node and run it. I'm gonna tell you, First, before I get into talking about how you can use this to help understand, build a mental model for your queries, I just also want to say, I think it's extremely important that people have some agency over the infrastructure they're running on. Again, it's, it's fine to use things like rweave.net and whatever GQL endpoints you use, but it's also really important if you're building a business to be able to run things yourself. That's an aside from this presentation, but I would really recommend, get experience, do this with rweave nodes too, to be honest. Get experience with the layers of the stack below what you're building and be able to run them. That's important. OK, that aside out of the way, what can you do with an RIO node to help build this mental model of like how your queries work? So you can get the gateway. You can run it. You can fire it up. You can index your data. And you can test your queries. And you can get SQL out of that. And you can run explain on it. Now, there's two things that may be going through your mind right now. One, ah, SQL. That's terrible. There's better things out there. First of all, no. <laughs> SQL is actually pretty good, way better than you think. And the things that you learn learning SQL will actually apply across a very wide range of systems, surprisingly wide. I've used a lot of different databases, NoSQL, SQL, all kinds of things. The intuition, I started on Oracle, by the way, which don't do that. But the intuitions you learn understanding this level 
will help you on lots of systems. Because they're all fundamentally going to do the same thing underneath at some level. They're going to do it a little differently, like how they execute queries is going to be different. But the steps that you will go through to think through what the query needs to do will be similar. OK, so you can do this. You can develop a mental query model. Um, and once you do this, you can start thinking about both the data model and the query interface. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Remember, SQL is the sixth love language. Look at this. This is beautiful. SQL, explain plan. Now, I will say the explain plan, it's a SQL I explain plan. Those are not the easiest to read, but this is pretty cool. And you will get used to this. Oh, another thing I should have mentioned earlier. When you run the RIO node, you will find it's using SQLite. And you will think, probably, ah, this is a toy. You're wrong. You could, we've put many terabytes in SQLite. It has indexing throughput. This will not be true forever, of course. But right now, it has indexing throughput to index everything on our weave. Okay. Now, you may hit some other constraints, but the indexing throughput is there. I can almost guarantee you that your app can run just fine on this thing. Not necessarily saying you should do that, but you can. So I've talked a little bit about using the RIO node as a tool for thinking about queries, developing a mental model. I wish I could walk you through some queries. There's just not enough time here. But I do want to talk about like your tags. So you started to develop this mental model using this tool. What can you do with your tags to make your life better? OK, so there's the main way I see people thinking about tags right now, which is as an information model. This is fine. People are doing this already. Like, I'm sure if I dug into things, I'd find problems. Probably everyone could criticize everyone else's stuff. But basically, this is good. People are making information models. They're good information models. But there's another way you can also think of tags, and that is as a query interface. What do I mean by that? OK. Traditionally, when you make large, scalable databases, you're going to need to denormalize. And you're going to do that based on query patterns. And you can think of your tags essentially as indexes. So don't stop doing the information model thing. Still model your information, but also think about tags basically as building indexes. And you can use tags to uh, basically combine things that you would want to query together into a single tag. And you get a lot of performance that way. Now, you should be careful with this, too, because you are baking some level of application uh, logic into your tags when you do this, which is why I say don't stop doing the information model thing, but also keep this in mind. And again, this is going to work across a wide range of databases. It's not just going to work well on SQLite or Postgres. It will work pretty well on everything if you start thinking this way. OK, some tips. So I'm just going to blow through these real quick. I have the QR code up there. If you want to go to our docs and see the list, so you can go back over it later. So specifically, how do you think about constructing queries? So try to always construct your queries so that you are using the most specific tags possible. Don't add extra tags, OK? So if you can basically get the same results with similarly specific tags and you're adding tags, you're almost always making the database do a little bit of extra work. The other thing, which I already mentioned, is just schema design. Basically, organize your tags around your query patterns, potentially. Don't always do that, but think about that as an option. Include non-tag fields. I can't really get into why this is the case right now, but and it's a little bit of a violation of the minimalism thing. But if you have fields like the owner on the transaction, things like that, those can be very helpful from optimization perspective. And again, this will apply on a wide range of databases. The last one in here is our IO node specific. So we have an explicit join order. So if you order your tags from most specific, so the things that filter down the most first, that's the optimal way to do it on an RIO. And I don't think this hurts other systems at all. Again, we'll, we'll probably have more generalizations of this in the future, but this is a convenient thing to know right now, especially if you're building on top of our stuff. This will give you the best performance, and it won't hurt elsewhere. Bonus round. This is an idea I want to get out there. We're leaving GraphQL land now. We're talking about how you can query data on are we still, but we're going to go into a different space. Does anyone know what DuckDB is? OK, cool, a few people. OK, so DuckDB is like SQLite, except it's like the analytics version of it. And there's a WASM version of DuckDB, which means you can run it all over the place. You can run it in the browser. 
And in fact, what I'm showing you here is actually the WASM version in the browser. Okay, so this is super cool. What can you do with this? You can let the clients query the data. And this is a very useful way to construct certain types of applications because you're essentially removing a dependency for your, from your application. Dependencies in general are not great, right? You wanna minimize them so you can give yourself more flexibility and avoid breakage. The other super cool thing about building this way is your query execution scales with the number of clients, right? As long as they can retrieve the data, you can execute as many queries as you want on the client. And that's a way different paradigm from I'm talking to a GraphQL API somewhere. There are other ways to do this too, and I'll, I'll come back, I, I, I should have talked more, a little bit more about the parquet thing at the beginning, but I'll come back to that. There are other ways to organize data such that you can query it on the client too. I don't have time to get into them here, but if you want to talk about any of that, hit me up afterwards. Um, I will shoot ideas into your brain. All right, so just practically though, how do you do this? So DuckDB itself, like it has its own data format, but it can also read Parquet. And Parquet is just a columnar data format. So you can put Parquet on Arweave. You can put it anywhere, honestly. You can do this on S3 too, which is also cool, but we're here for Arweave. So you put Parquet on Arweave, you point DuckDB at it. I think you can do some uh, partitioning things too, where you, I, I shouldn't talk about it, never mind. <laughs> the, the important thing about Parquet is that DuckDB will efficiently query it, so there's headers in Parquet that let you determine basically subsets of the data just by looking at the header. So it will do range requests and then request subsets of the data. So this is not as, like, it's not gonna pull down the whole file. It's way more efficient than you think. So this is a really interesting thing you can do. I think it opens up some design space that I haven't seen people explore a lot yet. And uh, yeah, it's a cool idea. All right, wrapping up, key points. Don't use the SCP field. Or do, it's like, we all do it, right? Like, I don't know the entire superscalar architecture of my CPU, but be mindful about it, right? Some abstractions are leaky. I would argue like a lot of database stuff is like that. Like, your execution of your query doesn't matter until it does, and then you're screwed because you already put data out there, and you're stuck with whatever execution model you have. So put a little time into thinking about it up front, and just think about how your queries are executed. Run a node. This is a crypto value. I think we do this, I don't know. Maybe I'm biased because I'm like making nodes that want people to run. I think we do this less than we should in Arweave. Run an Arweave node, run an RIO node. This is important. You need to have agency over your infrastructure. Think about tags as both a data model and a query interface. Don't stop doing the data model stuff. That's really important because you may get the query interface wrong. It's harder to do the query interface right. But also just keep that in your mind. That's an option you have for optimization. And then experiment with querying data on the client. I think it's a really interesting paradigm that I would like to see more people explore. And there's a whole range of apps you can build that then don't require that API endpoint at all to run GraphQL queries. And that's pretty cool because it makes your application even more autonomous. Thank you.